Today's reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. That's found on page 34 of your New Testament Bible, if you'd like to read along. The word of the Lord. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the sermon title this morning, Worship, Doubt, and the Trinity. Kind of strange bedfellows, aren't they? And obviously the odd one out is doubt. I mean, worship is one of the central activities of faith-filled people. The, the Trinity is an essential and distinguishing doctrine of the Christian faith. Clearly, those two go together quite well. But doubt? I mean, how did doubt creep in there into this triumphant final scene after the resurrection when Jesus is saying goodbye to his disciples before he ascends to heaven? Hear that verse again, Matthew 28, 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now the doubt mixed in there with worship in the Trinity can offend our sensibilities because most of the time we want things to be sure and certain, black and white. We want to get it right. And I think that's especially true of certain people in the world. People like my friend Chef, who is a firstborn child. They like to have things right and in order. But to some extent, we... We all tend to project a bit of obsessive, compulsive, anxious nature onto God and how we might relate to our Creator and to others. You see, we think we want a world governed by a very strict binary function like basic computer code, a one and a zero, either or, this or that, yes or no, you have it or you have not. She loves me, she loves me not. You're in or you're out. You're a success or a failure. You believe or you don't believe. But friends, if that is how God relates to us and deals with us, then I guess that means that we're all out. Because who among us has never had any doubts about God or God's relationship to us? And thank God, and I mean that literally, that this binary function of either or, this or that, is not how God works at all, according to the gospel reading for this Trinity Sunday. You know, in our most prideful moments, we are tempted to believe that if we'd been there with Jesus on that mountaintop, then we would not have fallen prey to confusion and doubt, all that stuff that affected the disciples then and there, but not so fast. You see, living between heaven and earth and hell is not so easy. You see, every Sunday in every place where Christians gather for this mountaintop experience we call worship with Jesus, we are a very mixed bag community of God's people who've come together. Some of us are clearly ready to worship God. Some of us, though, may be full of doubts. And that mix changes from day to day and from Sunday to Sunday, depending on what has happened during the intervening time. Now, it's true. The hope is that in the course of our time of worship together, that faith will win out over doubts but we have to admit that as we gather, we are a real hodgepodge, a real mix of where we are in our feelings and our emotions and our relationship with God. 
And this worship-doubt mishmash can't be solved as it is in the movies with a, a sudden download of all the faith and gifts necessary so that we are immediately transformed into super saints who can perform miracles as Neo did in the Matrix movies. No. As long as we are in this life, doubt will always be sort of lurking in the shadows of our faith journey. And the only way to deal with that shadow of doubt is to keep shining the light of the promise of Christ's powerful presence with us through trust. You remember when former President George H.W. Bush went skydiving a few years back on his 90th birthday? <laughs> the success of that adventure did not depend on his strength or ability, but depended on his trust in that parachute. And if you happen to miss the video of my jump from several years ago, you missed some great faces of fear, excitement, and total exhilaration. But trust was what it was all about. Similarly, the success of the adventure of obeying Jesus and going out on Jesus' mission to make disciples of all nations in the name of the triune God does not depend on our strengths or on our abilities, but rather on our trust in the promise of Jesus' powerful presence with us, even in the face of our doubts. Now, the amazing thing is, is that our doubts are actually not a problem for God. And we see that in the gospel reading. When Jesus sees his doubting disciples, he doesn't just sort of pull back and let them off the hook. He doesn't say, okay, you guys are obviously not ready for taking on my mission to the world. Why don't you come back when you're ready? Why don't you come back when you've got it all together? You see, Jesus didn't give up on them in spite of their doubts, even, even after they had seen all the evidence of his resurrection. The good news is he doesn't give up on us either. I want you to hear these words of affirmation and promise from the scripture that God, I hope, uses to help us in his rescue mission for the world in fact no matter how spiritually dysfunctional that we might feel at any given moment as individuals or even as a congregation the apostle paul's words to the church at corinth still apply here's what he says now you you are the body of christ and individually members of it in Christ, we are a new creation. We are God's masterpieces created in Christ Jesus for good works. And Peter, who so often vacillated between bold faith and doubt-filled fears, wrote that this is what we are. He said, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood a holy nation, God's own people, in order that we may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And friends, this is all the work of the triune God whose grace is sufficient to deal with every fear that oppresses us, whose power is made perfect in our weaknesses and even in our doubts. The Great Commission of Matthew 28 shows that the triune God does not hold back from us. Did you notice that verb upon verb upon verb is piled up here? Go, it says. Disciple. Baptize. Teach. Obey. Remember. And the key to all of those, especially when we might doubt is the last one. Remember. The only way we overcome doubts and fears is by remembering what is true and essential. And it helps when we remember how God has 
blessed us and been with us in the past? Can you think of a time that God has been with you in a tough situation in your life? Can you say amen? Can you remember when God blessed you in your life? Can you say amen? I remember during the period surrounding my divorce, I struggled greatly with trusting God. And it was the gift of remembering. Remembering how God had guided me in the past, how God had trusted me in the past despite my failings. It was that remembering that got me through those horrendous times. And it it amazes me still that God led me through that time and most of my sanity is still intact. (laughs) By the way, yesterday morning at the Florida Annual Conference in Orlando, we confirmed the pastoral appointments for the coming year. And it was exciting to see my name next to Christ by the Sea beginning my eighth year here among you. Hallelujah. Looking forward to a lot more. You know, one of the most amazing pieces of the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is that Jesus actually trusts people like you and me to accomplish this incredible mission. You see, we're the ones he gave the mission to, to go and make disciples of all the world. You and me. Can you believe that? People like us, Jesus gave that task to. Not the other person, (laughs) to you and to me. Jesus trusts us to accomplish this incredible mission. Now, my friend, Dr. Bob Tuttle, who worships with us when he's in town, I think he's up in North Carolina at the moment, he's writing a book on E. Stanley Jones. E. Stanley Jones is often called the Billy Graham of India. Jones is attributed with tens of thousands of Indian people coming to know Christ. Now, I want you to just imagine... If E. Stanley Jones had not taken the Great Commission seriously. Did you know that most of the current day followers of Jesus in the nation of India can trace back their faith to E. Stanley Jones? It's an amazing thing that he did. And I'm so glad that God trusted E. Stanley Jones in the early 20th century to evangelize the nation of India. And I'm so glad that God trusts you and me to share the good news in this century. You see, God trusted Jones and God trusts us to continue to share the good news despite the fact that we might have doubts and questions. You see, what a gift we have been given to share the gospel with this generation. And friends, I hope you don't take that gift lightly. It is not only a gift, but it's also a responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ with this generation. You see, we can all be sharers of the gospel through prayer, through our loving actions, through our families, with our friends, and eventually to that person that we just met. But it takes trust that God is with us as we share the good news even in the midst of our doubts and our questions. This morning I want to share some exciting news with you about some future ways that we're going to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with other people here in this community. A team of folks met recently to begin the planning of a new worship service to reach out in the name of Jesus with our Hispanic brothers and sisters here in the area. It was a spirit-filled time of God beginning a new thing in our midst. And all of our Spanish-speaking families are going to be there to assist us in making this new time of worship a reality. It's going to be a dynamic 75 minutes of contemporary bilingual worship, and it's going to be called Cafe Worship at Christ by the Sea. With that at, you know, that little at sign like at (laughs) gmail.com. 
just to be cool. <laughs> it's going to be on Tuesdays, Tuesday evenings, beginning in late August. We're going to have a coffee house for the first 30 minutes. Some really good espresso will be served. Maybe some lattes. Some other good stuff like that. Perhaps something to nibble on. Scones, maybe scones, <clears throat> maybe some Spanish pastries, if we could get some wonderful people to make those. Empanadas, okay, empanadas, that'll work. <clears throat> Are you getting ready to go? <clears throat> and I tell you, I'm, I'm looking forward because we're going to have that coffee house, then we're going to move into this time of worship and praise, and I'm so looking forward to sharing more about this in the coming weeks with you. But we are trusting God to be with us, to guide us, to bless this outreach to our community as we share the gospel in a fresh way, reach out to the next generation, and celebrate this triune God of ours. It's going to be good. Right? It is. Recently, I, I was at a pool, and I was observing a father teaching his young child how to swim. And whenever his son would begin to panic in the water, the dad would tell him to start floating on his back. You see, he, he needed to be reminded, this boy needed to be reminded of his basic buoyancy and trust the water to hold him up. Friends, for us, the remembrance of the promise of Jesus' powerful presence with us is what holds us up. And that memory is the only adequate antidote to the doubts that would infect us. Because the risen Christ is with us always, and because all authority has been given to him, we can dare to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them Christ way of life because that's what being a Christian is is following the way of Christ life being a Christian is not saying I've joined a church being a Christian is not even reading the Bible every day or praying every day being a Christian means that you actually follow Jesus and live your life the way that he tried to live his life. That's what our goal is as a follower of Jesus. Friends, that's our high calling. To share the Jesus life with others. And by the way, there's no doubt about that. Amen and amen.